All right, so um, this Sunday will be the last of our, we, our essential series that we've been doing. So we've actually looked at um, uh, prayer uh, first as one of our essentials. We've looked at uh, dealing with sin and then uh, the power of words, uh, godly speech. Uh, this past week we looked at loving God, loving people. And, uh, and I believe we had uh, the week before that and Sunday, we had living uh, the word of God growing and obedience and application. I'm sure those titles are way off because <laughs> I'm doing it by the top of my head. So um, welcome to uh, Calvary Chapel Divine. I'm Pastor Michael Petit. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about sharing the gospel. And then on Sunday we'll finish uh, and we'll be looking at discipleship. Um, and... On the week after that, we will actually begin uh, the book of Ephesians on Sunday. So we'll be verse by verse, chapter by chapter in the book of Ephesians. And then uh, we have prayer next Wednesday. So hopefully you got your prayer book. You've been writing down your prayers and and uh, we'll come together. I mean, you don't have to get too deep and, and personal, but I mean, we would love to hear the prayers that have been answered already. And then the ones that we still need to be praying for. And then there, there's some stuff I'm going to give y'all as a church that I need y'all to be praying for. Um, you know, it, it's, it, you know, at the end of the day, I talked to, uh, we had two, it's kind of crazy, we had two possible buildings today. And they're not the one that we looked at. It's something completely different. So it's like, it, it just, I don't really see that being an issue down the road, uh, but we just need to be in prayer for it. And then we also, if y'all could, um, we have somebody here that's dealing with uh, bulging discs, lower back. If y'all can pray for healing. And uh, I think some of y'all are on the prayer chain uh, on Facebook or on the WhatsApp. So if y'all can be praying for healing for her and uh, and just for the control of pain, because whenever you have that kind of stuff, happen, it's, it's tough. Uh, and then uh, there was one more thing. Oh, movie night. So this Friday night at Reuben and Michelle's uh, movie night. Uh, if y'all need to get the address, we, we had them on the bulletin this past week, but y'all can get with Reuben and Michelle before you head out of here as we come together and just enjoy uh, a time of fellowship. Uh, so let's go ahead and pray, and we'll go ahead and get into this and, and get started. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for just allowing us to be here, Lord. Um, it's always amazing at the end of the day when uh, people want to come out on a Wednesday night just to hear your word and, and uh, to be in fellowship. And we thank you for that, Father God. Uh, we do pray. We pray for our sister that's dealing with uh, uh, the pain that she's having in her back. We ask, Lord, for healing. We ask, Lord, that you would help her be able to sleep and, and have that pain be controlled. Uh, and we pray that... Uh, that, that uh, at the end of the day, Lord, that you would just get her, be able to have her back on her feet soon, Lord, and, um, and, and moving around without any discomfort. Uh, we thank you, Father God, for all that you're doing uh, within this community and this church, and uh, we do pray as the radio continues to go out and pray for that, and at the same time, Lord, we do lift up our marriages and our families and, uh, and just pray for the businesses that are represented uh, within this church and we do pray Lord we don't know what the plan is with uh, having something a little bit a little bit more permanent uh, that possibility is always exciting um, I know the sound guys and all the people that set up you know praise God for them their hands and feet as they do the work of the Lord every Sunday and Wednesday we thank you for them and we just ask Lord that you just continue to bless us and and bless us our uh, bless this time that we're in your word uh, that we would seek application, that we would seek opportunities to share the gospel. We thank you, Father God, for all that you're doing. We do pray for those that are watching at home online as well. Uh, we lift this uh, night up to you, and we pray that we would uh, just be ready to be in your presence and be in your word. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight we're looking at essentials, follower of Christ, not ashamed to share the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, a verse that's very popular uh, that I know for me, it was something I, when I first came to faith, uh, I learned early on was, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and to also uh, to the Greek. 
And, and so tonight we're going to look at simply sharing uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the importance of it. They kind of go hand in hand. As we look at uh, preaching the word or sharing the gospel of Christ, you have to, once you do that, you have to be ready to make disciples. And so that's why we're looking Sunday at discipleship. And, and so we, we start, um, we will start Sunday uh, talking about discipleship and as it begins in the marriage and in the home. So um, if you haven't signed up, now that I'm thinking about it, First Baptist Divine, they're doing the, um, the conference, <laughs> I'm forgetting already, Kingdom Connected uh, Conference on Discipleship. It is free. I can tell you, uh, I was, we got the information for Calvary Chapel Association Conference. That went up, doubled in price this year. And to have a conference that's right across the street over here to be free, and they open it up to all the churches. And so hopefully you all get to go. It's on a Friday and a Saturday. So Friday evening, Saturday morning, and then you get the rest of the day. I think it's finished by 1 o'clock, and I think they're even feeding you all. So uh, you're going to get fed on top of everything else. So... Uh, hopefully y'all can come and hang out with me because I'll be teaching on both nights on Friday and Saturday night and uh, so make sure y'all get registered it's uh, the 16th uh, is it 17th and 18th 17th and 18th I'm teaching I should know that you know <laughs> I'll try to remember that all right so when we look at the gospel uh, of, of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ we look at Paul the apostle Paul and Paul was dealing with this moral decay that was happening in uh, Rome. And uh, the, the Roman Empire, Nero, uh, who was a, a wicked man, actually believed that, that, that the only thing Christians were good for were to use them as lamps in, on the way into the city. He would set them on fire. Uh, and sadly, what happens is with Paul, Paul comes in and, and begins to talk about repentance and holiness and, and what it is to pursue a godly, a godly life. And, uh, and it goes completely opposite against the culture that we're in today. So even in Rome during Paul's time, the gospel was against the culture then. It will always be against the culture. That's why it is not easy for you to share the gospel. But that doesn't mean you just go and go, I'm not going to do it. It has been commanded that we all do it. When Paul preached, pre he preached the gospel everywhere he went. So even when he was in prison in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, verse 23, and chased out of Thess Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, verse 10, when he was smuggled out of Berea in Acts 17, 14, he was mocked in Athens in Acts 17, 32, he was called a fool in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And then he, again, he was stoned in Galatia in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Paul remained eager to preach the gospel. Even after being stoned, they, I mean, they just, they lit him up. And, and it was people within the crowd that were getting everybody like, hey, he's teaching a gospel that goes against God. And so what do you do with those people? You stone them to death. And so that's what they did with Paul. They left him outside the city dead. What did Paul do? He shook it off and he went right back into the city. You're going to get, when you share the gospel, you are going to go through times when, unfortunately, you are going to, you may not get the best response when sharing the gospel. But at the end of the day, one of the things that we have to do is when we share the gospel, we need to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading. Uh, meaning that, that meaning that when, when the Holy Spirit's telling us you need to go talk to that person or you need, to, you need to pray with that person or you need to introduce yourself to that person, you need to do it. But you need to be sensitive to the Spirit. And you cannot be sensitive to the Spirit if you're not connected to the power of the Holy Spirit. If your relationship, that's why we went over, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Everything in your existence. And you can't love your neighbor, everybody's your neighbor. You can't share the gospel with your neighbor if your relationship with God is all whacked out. And you're having problems with that. So you need to be connected to the power of the Holy Spirit, sensitive to the Spirit's leading. 
We need to humbly build a bridge. Humbly build a bridge. Humility goes a long way. When, when, you're, when you're sharing the gospel, it's not trying to win theological arguments. And I've seen this happen a lot, where people get into it and they start trying to win a theological argument, and that's not what the gospel's for. Uh, and then we arouse interest. We actually, we actually impose or ask questions to them. Like, where did you hear that from, or where did you learn that? You're, you, you're, you're engaging them. You're arousing interest. And then you reveal sin. And I can tell you that's a delicate dance. But you got to do it. And then you explain the plan of salvation. If you just figure out that is an acronym called SHARE. And that was given to us by Lloyd Pulley. And he used that acronym during 9-11. When they had to have conversations, really hard conversations, because he was outside the city of New York in New Jersey, and they were doing ministry in New York during 9-11. And this was one of the things that he got from that time that he spent engaging people, which is to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading, humbly build a bridge, arouse interest, reveal sin, and explain the plan of salvation. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, a verse that we're all very familiar with is, uh, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We have been called to be the salt and the light in this, this world, but, you know, unfortunately what happens to a lot of people is they don't want to be that salt and light. They just want to kind of do their thing and be a Christian on their, on their own time, not at work or not out in public, but they'll do it here when they're at church. And that's not what God's called us to do. If you think about Jonah, when Jonah was called to go to Nineveh, Jonah was called to go to Nineveh, and what did Jonah do? He went the other direction. He did what he wanted to do. And that's not what God's called us to do. If we're, if we're being led by God to, to go speak to somebody or to share the gospel with somebody, we need to do it. A at the end of the day, it's, it's, they needed the gospel. Nineveh was the size of New York City. And it was a corrupt city. But they needed Jesus. They needed the gospel. Uh, they needed the gospel to be given to them, to, preach, to be preached to them, to tell them to do what? To repent. And we need that today in our, in our nation. We need that in our state. And we even need it here in Divine. And we forget that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We talked about it uh, this past week as Billy Graham always told uh, the leaders that he had in his church, that he wanted faithful, available, teachable leaders. Faithful, available, teachable leaders. Meaning that, look, they can be faithful and available, but they're, if they're not teachable, he goes like, they're no good to me. They have to continue to grow. They have to continue to learn. And, and part of that is like we're, we're continuing to grow and learn, and there's new ways for us to share the gospel. And whether you use Roman roads or you... Or, or you use way of the master. They, they all work. But you know what also works? The Bible. You can share. What did Jesus say right off the bat? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. What did John the Baptist say? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's like we have to, we have to deal with our sin. And when we share, our, share our, our story, one of the things that I see a lot of times is we will glorify our sin... And not glorify God within the story. You, you need to be quick. You should be able to share your, your testimony in three minutes. In and out. In and out. If you're going on, it's 30 minutes into it. It's like, it's, no, you can't do that. So we need to be first sensitive to the Spirit's leading. Acts chapter 6 verse 5 says this, and 
And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, Philip. And we see that Philip was chosen, but Philip is going to be sent out. In Acts chapter 8, we see the story there in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Uh, this is a desert place. And he went and rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had just come uh, to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading uh, the prophet. Isaiah and the spirit said to Philip go over and join the chariot so Philip has this this ministry that's blossoming like he has a revival happening and God says I need you to go speak to this one person now with all of our plans and programs that churches do they wouldn't do that because it's like no we're, the, the church is growing this is where we need to be but where is the spirit, spirit leading Philip out to go speak to this Ethiopian? And it's important for us to understand that. It's like when the Spirit's uh, moving for us to, to, uh, to speak to somebody, we need to be obedient to the Spirit and do it. And it may be uncomfortable. You may, you may not do anything but get a hello out. You just don't know. But you want to do something, and that is be obedient to the power of the Holy Spirit. You want to be obedient to the power of the Spirit. In John chapter 6, verse 63, it said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are the Spirit and life. Can I tell you, when you are led by the Spirit, the Spirit will open the door for that conversation to happen. It'll happen. And I can tell you this has happened to me because I, I, I spent over a year with my son going to a barber. Worst thing in the world is to be bald-headed sitting in a barber shop for over an hour and a half because he had to get one of the fancy haircuts. You know, the barbers now, it's, I mean, you can get a haircut. I remember back in the day, five bucks on base. You get your head shaved, get a flat top and be done and in and out, right? But the barbers nowadays are 40 bucks plus tip. And so he was paying for his haircuts, and, and I was like, okay, I'll go sit. And I remember the first few times I went, I was just like, man, can I hurry up and get out of here? And the conversations are ungodly. And the music is ungodly. And I'm just like, man, I need to get out of here. And one time I went, the Spirit put on my heart, you're here for a reason. You need to start having conversations. You're missing it, and they're right here. And so I started having conversations. We started off with sports, right? And then started talking about music. And then from there, we started talking about Christian hip-hop. And they were asking, like, what artists are there? Who's out there to listen to? I gave them some people to listen to. And this conversation went on for a year. And finally, somebody's within the barbershop lost a loved one. And I asked the question, do you know what happens to you when you die? Within that moment, the gospel got shared. And we prayed for one of the barbers. Now, I didn't do anything. That's what the Lord did. And what's amazing about this is Matt ran into that barber at HEB on 211. And that dude is from Petite, Texas, and he's like, bro, I listen, I hear your dad every day on the radio. Not our radio station, Joe's, <laughs> on Cage Rye. And he was like, I hear your dad, I, that voice stays in my head for some reason. And he goes, I'm, I'm in church, I got plugged in, I'm serving God. Now, I could have I continued being... Well, I don't know why I'm in a barbershop. Why I got to sit in a barbershop? I got no hair. What am I doing here? And I, I could keep doing that. Or I'm going to go sit in the car. But one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're sensitive to the Spirit. 
you know when we look at look at the world as he's talking about that in john 6 verse 63 it is the spirit who gives life the flesh has no help the word that i have spoken to you uh our spirit and life and so what he's talking about here is that you know even in ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with christ by grace you have been saved it describes the world as being dead and blind That's why you're the light. They're blinded. And they're dead. In John 5, 21, it says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. And I heard uh, Erwin Lutzer actually share something, and Francis Chan has shared the story as well. But Erwin Lutzer had a, a, a professor when he was going to uh, uh, you know, seminary school. Uh, to get his uh, degree, one of his degrees, one of the minis that he has. But uh, the professor took them to the cemetery. And, and he, he goes, I want you all to see this as there's, the unbeliever is dead. And he goes, and I want you to share the gospel here to the dead. And the students are like, what are we doing right and he told him he goes i don't care who you are you can you can bring the best teacher the best expository teacher you can bring the best evangelist you can bring the best worship but you're still preaching to the dead it is the power of the holy spirit that brings life not us not us and we need to remember that we share the gospel, and we share the gospel to a very perverse generation that we have right now. And it's God that does the work. You may not get much out. You may get the whole gospel out, and you may get, well, I already know Jesus. All that stuff happens. But in even, even in the early church, when uh, in Acts chapter 2, we see what they, they, their focus was, and it was in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47, and it says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this per perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the word of God, uh, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were, were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among us, among all as, as anyone had need. So continually, daily, with one, one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So again, if we read John chapter 6, verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. What is our focus? The Word of God, prayer. If you know you're going to speak to somebody prior to that, you need to be in prayer for that conversation. Koinia is actually fellowship. It's meaning that you're admonishing with the word of God in fellowship. And then the breaking of bread. They kept it very simplistic. And look what God does. Signs and wonders and the church grows. Because they just go out and they share Christ and they share, they, they, they share their time with others. Because we have to remember, it's the Holy Spirit that grows the church, not us. But we have to be willing to do what we've been commanded to do, which is to share the gospel and make disciples. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the uh, surpassing power belongs to God and not us. See, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we can serve God and succeed in doing it because it's the Holy Spirit that's doing it, doing the work. 
We can succeed in loving others. And we can succeed by walking by faith and not by sight. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers every believer to see the world through the eyes of Jesus and to identify the heart of God. I shared this once before a while back at, at, at Grace, and I, I remember reading this story that a pastor had as he was talking about being sensitive to the Spirit. He was a pastor out of Houston, Texas, and, and he had a, a deer blind out in um, out of Marble Falls. He used to go hunting, had property out of Marble Falls. And so he was, during the summer, he was working on the deer blind, and he was in overalls covered in muck and mud, and they went and grabbed a hamburger at the hamburger place that they had there, and he wanted chocolate milk. I don't know why he wanted chocolate milk, but he wanted chocolate milk. And so he goes to, he's like, he goes out of his way to go to this little mom and pop store to get chocolate milk. Now he's a pastor. He comes in, there are kids outside crying. He goes in, there's another girl by the register crying. And he grabs his chocolate milk and the little girl goes out and he asks the, the store clerk, he said, what's going on? And the, the, the quarterback of the high school died in a car accident and his neck broke. And so as he was going to go out the door, the Spirit put on him, you need to share the gospel for these kids. And so he listened to the kids. He cried, he let, like, hey, man, y'all cry. Let me pray for y'all. Does anybody want to receive Christ? Do you know where you're going to go when you die? And he went on back to the deer blind and then back to Houston. Six months later, he was in Austin, Texas doing a conference. A little girl comes up to him, and she goes, you don't remember me, do you? And he goes, no, who are you? And she tells him, she goes, I was one of the people that you prayed for outside the, the store in Marble Falls. And she goes, I wanted to let you know I got to share the gospel with my dad. My dad had been an alcoholic his whole life. And he gave his life to Christ. He died a few months later. He got to talk with her, pray with her. He, he goes back in the next year, he goes back to work on his duck blind again, or his deer blind. And the pastor comes out there and says, hey, I need you to come and, and teach. We have a revival happening in Marble Falls. And he goes, well, that's your job, pastor. He goes, no, you started this with your chocolate milk. <laughs> so they end up having a thousand people show up in a barn out in Marble Falls. They had over a hundred and something people give their life to Christ. That night, they had them back again six months later. They ended up having 270 something people give their life to Jesus. All because that guy was sensitive to the spirit. And all he thought he was going there for was chocolate milk. We don't know where God is moving us and directing us. We just need to be ready and open and be sensitive to the spirit to do it. Once we do that, we humbly build a bridge. And we know Jesus does this in John chapter 4, verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to drink water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. And so, first off, we know that, that Samar the Samaritans were somebody that the Jews would have nothing to do with. They were outcasts. And then to make it worse, is she's actually getting water during the hottest part of the day, so she's an outcast within the society that she's in right now, in the culture that she's in. But Jesus is wanting to talk with her and, and, and actually, you know, humbly build a bridge to, 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 to share about repentance. And, and so one of the things I love about Christ is he didn't conform to the world because if, it was, if he had conformed to the religion, he never would have talked to her. Because the Jews would have nothing to do with the Samaritans. And we need to be willing to, to, to share the gospel because the gospel is for everybody. 
When we humbly build bridges, we're humbly building bridges across cultural divides, uh, across, across racial divides, political divides. We're building bridges and sharing Christ. We know in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, and Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, as he talked about the rich young ruler. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and, and come and follow me. Disheartened by saying he went away sorrowful for he had, a great, had great possessions. The thing that we get from that is that Jesus had no problem sharing, sharing truth but with love. Those possessions that you have, they have a hold of you to a point where they become your God and you need to let go of them and follow me. And he says it in a, such a gentle way, but it's so true. And he's like, look, I'm not going to sit and argue theological points with you. Sell everything you own and follow me. He kept it very simplistic. We have to remember, even in, in 1 Corinthians, in uh, chapter 3, verses 6 and 8, it says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So you may talk to somebody and not, you feel like, man, I didn't get anywhere. I got a little bit out, and that was it. I've shared a little bit, but you got to remember, it's like one plants, one waters. But it's God that gives the growth. And one of the things we don't want to do is we don't want to build walls up as we're talking uh, and sharing God with people. And, and that's why I tell people all the time, it's very hard for people to minister to your family. And if I ask for a show of hands of how many of us have ministered to family members and had walls go up, we'd probably all raise our hands. Ministering to your family is one of the hardest things you'll do. And you need to be very sensitive to the Spirit, meaning that you need to be led by the Spirit and you need to be humbly building bridges because you know what? They know you. They know the old you. And they have no problem throwing that in your face. <laughs> They'll do that in a heartbeat. But you need to be loving and share truth with them. If you've already shared the gospel with them, there's no need for you to start beating them over the head with the Bible every time you see them. Just love on them. Just love on them. You know, I had my, my, my son, when we first came to Christ, one of the things that we had was uh, the young girl that he was dating at the time was um, their relationship. They were in sin, and we, we just had to let them know, hey, what's going on in y'all's life is sin. My son left. But all I did over the next six months was just be available. He's already heard me share the gospel to him. He already heard me share what's going on in his life. He doesn't really need to hear anything else from me at that point. He just needs to be loved on. And six months later, that relationship comes crashing down because we knew it was going to. And that's when he had somewhere to go. He showed up at church. Crying. Reestablishing his relationship with God. And, and, and so when we, and you know who talked to him? It wasn't me. It was Louie and Hector. Pastor Louie and Pastor Hector. And I was okay with that because those are my brothers. I was like, man, I know they're going to give him godly wisdom, godly advice. They're going to kind of put him back on the road that he needs to be on. And I'm okay with that. Because sometimes it's not us that, that, that is able to share with a family member. Sometimes it's somebody else. And we need to allow that to happen. But we do need to be consistent in our prayer for that person. So just because you go, well, okay, well, I can't really share with that family member. You need to be praying for that person consistently every day. Every day. Just, Lord, reach him. Touch his heart. Bring him to Christ. Let him know you. Show up real in his life. You do that. And so once you've been sensitive to the Spirit and you've humbly built a bridge, now you're going to arouse interest. We go back to the story in Acts chapter 8 with Philip. In Acts chapter 8, verse 30, so Philip ran to him. I love that because, man, Philip was no joke. Philip was told, hey, 
There's a revival happening in this city, but I need you to go here. What does Philip do? He goes. And then what does he say? Hey, I need you to go talk to this person. And he runs. And that's how we should be obedient to the Spirit. So Philip ran to him and, and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can, I, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he opens uh, not his mouth. In humiliation, justice was denied. Who can describe his, uh, destri describe his generation for his life is taken away from earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, but uh, about whom I asked, uh, ask you, do, do the prophet say the, uh, this about himself or about someone else? So Philip is ready to answer the question. And he's going to answer the question. But one of the things that I love is like at the end of the day, this man has just been in religion. He's just coming from Passover. And he's still got questions. That's what religion does. Religion will leave you a asking questions and asking questions. I heard Pastor Poncho this morning on the radio. And he was talking about all those years as a kid growing up as a Catholic. And just dealing with when he came to, to faith and, and trying to understand what was not religion and what was relationship because he, he was beat to death with religion, with Catholicism. And for us, we see this eunuch, he was at the Passover and he was at religious, uh, they, they were all these religious activities and yet he's still asking questions. He's still asking questions and Philip is patient enough and ready to answer the question and, and we need to be ready to cross the line when it's time to answer that question. See, sometimes what happens is when, when you can tell when somebody's not interested in what you're talking about. And guess what? You need to back away. Because if you're going to keep pushing, you're going to irritate them and, and they're just going to shut down. You need to back away. You need to be willing to to uh, to be patient with that person, willing to to have discussions with them but if they're if they're moving on from a discussion you need to move on as well you've tried you pray for them you you, you give them ta give them thanks for having that time to be able to share and you move on a lot of times what we see is there's been so many so many people that have had the bible beaten across their heads as the gospel is shared and that's not what god's asked as we see with Philip, we see Philip, he's, he's, he's obedient to the Spirit, and he can talk to the eunuch, and the eunuch has all these questions, and yet he was with all this religion, and he still not, doesn't have the answers yet. In Acts 4.13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Can I tell you, and this is very important, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. People need to be able to recognize your relationship with Christ. They need to know that you're, you're a follower, meaning that they see, they see the love, they see the action, because faith is an action, love is an action. Like they see that happening. They see the boldness of you stepping out and, and serving and, and, and being there for others. For instance, the, the young man in the bar broke his hand. He's got two pins in his hand, just had surgery. He's trying to lift stuff up. And I was like, bro, if you got to lift anything up, you come get one of us and we'll do that. We're loving on others. That's what we do. And then I got to talk to him about his surgery. And let me tell you something. We've had conversations over the past few weeks, but it's taken time. And it starts with general conversation. Who's your neighbor? Yeah, you know where your physical neighbor is next door. But your neighbor can be somebody at the, at the, when you're shopping at HEB. And you can see they're struggling and you help them. 
It can be somebody, uh, your, your waiter or your waitress. You actually pray for them. Lord, thank you. Give them, give them peace tonight. Because you can see the place looks like chaos. And you engage them. That's what you're doing. It, it, it's showing love. The love of Christ. They should know, just like it says here about Peter and John, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Let me ask you a question. If we were to talk to your neighbor, if we were to talk to somebody other than somebody within your household, and they said, hey, has Mike, has Mike been with Jesus? Is there evidence there? And that's, that's really the reality of it. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I love that. It's like they continue to pray. Everything we do is, is through prayer. And then we go back to Philip. Philip, in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and, the be and beginning with Scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. I love that. He was bold, ready to share the gospel. Your mouth needs to be ready to be open. Half the battle is saying hello. Half the battle is just saying, man, how are you doing today, bro? That's half the battle. And, and you're, just, you're just trying to be attentive to the conversation that's happening. And, and we need to be more engaged. What happens and what I see, which drives me crazy, is, man, we talked about it this past weekend, you know, when we talked about that 80-year lifespan, that the average 80-year lifespan and 26 years of it, you spend sleeping. Some of us spend more than 26 years sleeping, right? But 13 years you'll spend of your life working. But 11 years you'll spend on a device. 11 years you will spend, and they said that's going to continue to trend upward because we're handing devices to kids like candy. And so whether it's a game, whether it's a, a phone, whether it's a laptop, PC, a television, we are plugged in and checked out. And think about it. When you go to restaurants, just think about this for a second. How many people do you see on the phone at the table? At a restaurant. Like you're there with each other, with company. The person you're supposed to talk to is directly in front of you. Put the phone down. Put the phone down. We'll talk about that this weekend when we talk about discipleship. That drives me crazy. You have time. Like your, your time is limited with your kids and your wife, your spouse, with your family. I, I, man, I'm not taking you out to dinner to spend time with the phone. I'm taking, out, taking you out to dinner because I want to I be able to talk with you. I want to know what's going on with you. I want to know how you're doing. Man, my grandfather, Lord have mercy. You know, you're, you're, we would eat dinner at the dinner table. You're, you're engaging like that's part of your, your, your opportunity to talk. How was your day? What's going on? And what do we do? We grab the food, and we're right in front of the TV. And we're not talking to nobody. Turn that stuff off at least a couple days out of the week and spend it talking with each other, engaging each other. Once we arouse interest, we, we reveal sin. And this is part of the hardest part of the conversation. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you sorrow over sin and it does not lead to repentance, it has no value. We can be sorrowful over our sin, but if it doesn't lead to repentance, it has no value. And that's what Satan's goal is altogether, is just to be discouraged.
for you to be frustrated. That's it. And for you to go right back to it again. See, godly, godly sorrow leads to a change in the way you live and see things. It means that, that, again, we talked about that. When you recognize your sin, you confess your sin, you, you actually turn from your sin and turn to Christ. And then that, that repentance actually bears fruit. Like people can see, hey man, whatever they were dealing with is good. God has really moved in that person's life. Because they're bearing fruit. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 and 10 says this, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did, did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a little while. Now rejoice now. You were made sorry, but your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry, sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us. Uh, nothing for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world produces death. And, and repentance is not remorse. Remorse is, uh, I'm sorry I got caught. That just produces death. In Luke chapter 15, verses 16, it says, And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. You know, as we talk about the, the prodigal son, it, it, uh, he, he's saying, I am sorry I'm here in this pig pen. I'm sorry I lost my wealth. I'm sorry in this position. I'm sorry... Uh, you know, I may die in this pig pen, but he's still thinking about himself. And it's not until he realizes that his father, but he came to himself in verse 17. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have made more, and more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Like he's like, hey. He comes to himself like he gets to a point where he goes, you know what? Got to stop feeling sorry for myself. I've sinned. I've sinned. And the behavior that he had was <laughs> very regrettable for sure. But that's also what repentance is, isn't. It's not regret. It's not playing the I, I wish I hadn't done it. I wish I could have done this over. I could have lived this way. You can't live it over. But you can live the new creation in Christ that you've been called to be. Because see, that's what Judas did. Judas was sorry and he just hung himself. Repentance is not reform. I'm going to stop today. You know what? I'm going to start serving people today. I'm going to start going to church. That's just reform. That's all that is. Repentance is, is you know, re when you look at reform, reform is works. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by the grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't reform yourself from to repentance. And religion is not repentance. And that's where we're at today is we have all of this new age spiritualism and we remove Jesus and they, you know, all roads lead to heaven. And that's what, that's what the devil wants you to believe. The eunuch that Philip was talking to had just left religion in Jerusalem and he's still searching for answers. He just spent a few days in religion, and he's still looking for answers. And guess what? There are many churches in America that are filled with the same mess. You have people that have, have sat in church, and they really haven't repented. They haven't asked God to forgive their sins. They haven't turned from their sins. You think about Chris Cornell from Soundgarden. Now, some of y'all may not know who that is. I grew up with that. and He killed himself. 
And, and one of the quotes that he had in Rolling Stone magazine, Chris Cornell said this. He said, so many bad things as well as good things have happened based on people blindly following religion. That I kind of feel like I want to stay away uh, from any type of specific denomination or any religion, period, for, for no other reason than just that, that they were both around religious people growing up and both try to fill that hole with every, with every other thing but Jesus. And religion just pushes people away. And sadly, Chris Cornell, you know, when we look at his life, it's sad because at the end of the day, what, what we do is when we look at people's life like Chris Cornell or, you know, we had Austin Carlisle here at the football field event uh, of Mice and Men who's a, a follower of Christ now, who's with the whosoevers, and, and goes out and shares the gospel. And he'll tell you, he toured with these guys, with Soundgarden. I forget the other guy. Who's the other guy from the, um, that killed himself from that other, I forget the group's name. My kids listen to it. But at the end of the day, they toured with those guys. And they had the money. They had the drugs that they Wanted. They had the women they wanted. They had the houses they wanted. And there was a hole that could not be filled. It can only be filled with Jesus. Religion can't fill that hole either. It's relationship. That's why we were so adamant about you understanding. Like the stuff that's going on in here. God wants to help you with that stuff. That's why he says I want all of your heart. And all of your soul. And all of your mind. I'm going to make you a new creation in Christ. They won't even recognize you again. They're going to be like, who is that guy? And we want to see repentance that actually turns towards Jesus. Because repentance that comes from Christ actually is giving life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, it says, Now I, I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Your sorrow led to repentance. Pastor Chuck Smith said this, sorrow alone accomplishes nothing. Peter was sorry he, was, he denied Christ, but he repented. Judas was sorry he betrayed Jesus, but instead of repenting, he went and killed himself. So when we repent, we're repenting of the, there, there are consequences of sin and understanding like that our sin impacts others. You know, Jesus said, and this is something for our country today. You know, when, when he, he tells us in Luke chapter 7, verses 13, remember Lot's wife. We're living in Sodom and Gomorrah right now. And there'll come a day when, when fire is going to come down on this nation, if it's not already happening as we speak. Judgment will come if we don't turn back to Christ. We're allowing things in our schools, in our culture that, that are impacting our kids that, that were worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, because he was like, look, Lot's wife lingered back and longed for the world, for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's telling you, don't be longing for that. He tells you in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus said to him, No one puts his hands to the plow and looks back as fit for the kingdom of God. He's like, look, just put your hands to the plow and you focus on me. And you leave that mess behind you. And so many of us are, are, are longing and looking back at our old lifestyle. Like there's some... You know, romance with that. And you need to let that go. And you need to stop crawfishing. What does crawfish do? It goes backwards. You're backsliding. You need to cut that stuff out. Put your hands to the plow. Follow me. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You love your Lord God. It's not Mike's God. It's your God. You have to make that your God. 
Let me tell you something. You need to, as a follower of Christ, repentance would be something you do daily. Daily. Because we're all sinners. We're forgiven. Our past, our present, our future sins forgiven. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't want us dealing with our sins still. And how many people you know that go up and just say the prayer? Well, I'm saved. And you look at their life and you go, there's no change in your life at all. Matter of fact, you've gotten worse. Very important. He said to follow me and do what? Die to self. Pick up your what? Your cross. And you follow me. And there should be fruit from your repentance. You should look different. Now, for some people, it's very small changes that happen over time. And some people, it's like a weed just coming up. It just sprouts. I can tell you, I, I didn't come to faith till late in life. I was 39 years old. And so for me... I know everything the world can offer, and it's nothing that I want. I don't want to go back to that no more. I want, to, I want that new creation in Christ. I want to continue being that. I want to keep my hands to the plow and just keep going. And not long back like Lot's wife. And one of the things we have to be very careful with, there's this great verse, and um, when it talks about the son of Reuben in First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1, the son of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn because he defiled his father's couch. His birthright was given to the sons of Joseph and the son of Israel so that he could not be enrolled as the oldest son. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but when you go down to verse 4, when they described his character, they described his character as being, the word in the Hebrew is unstable as water. Is that you? Is that your character? Are you unstable as water? Our faith should not be unstable as water. Then finally, we see that he explains the plan of salvation. Very simple steps. You share the gospel, and you can follow these four simple steps. You tell them about God's plan. That, you, you, that God loves you and wants, wants you to experience peace and to have a life that he offers. And that's an abundant life. And he tells you in the verse we all know very well, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You share the problem. You, you talk about the separation from God. What causes us to be separate from God is our sin. We were born with it. And if you, any of y'all have nieces, nephews, if you have sons or daughters, you know sin exists because you know, who taught them to lie? They do that on their own when they're little. And you're like, where did you get that from? Because you're born with that sin nature from Adam and Eve. You're born into a fallen world. And there was a purpose and a reason that Jesus Christ came. So that way we could be actually, we were separated from God. And you're either an enemy of the world or you're for God. And, and, and the reality of it is, is like we have an opportunity to have our, our, our sin paid for and to be in relationship with God. Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because he died for the sins of this world. And we talk about God's remedy, and that's where we go to the cross. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. And then finally is our response. 
You ask them if they want to receive Christ, if they want to have uh, to, to have Christ take residence in their heart. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him to them, he gave them the right to become children of God. And that's what he gives us the opportunity to be, as children of God. Remember, we talked about it this past weekend, about the Abba Father. He wants that connection. And some of us, when I think about that, and I didn't think about that this past weekend, some of us, when we think about our earthly fathers, we cringe because of our earthly fathers. But that's not God. You're talking about a, a God that's perfect, a God that's loving, a God that's all-knowing, that wants to be your father, your Abba Father. Not, not this earth, earthly father that we had here. Some of us have had really bad... I've had... Man, I had... My dad's a really good man now. He wasn't when I was growing up. He was an alcoholic. And he was a violent alcoholic. And then my mom decided to marry a... When she, my mom and dad divorced, decided to marry a drug addict who was a violent drug addict. And so I was running out the house at 17. As quickly as I could, right into the army. And, and so... You know, the reality of it is I have an Abba Father who's perfect. My dad, God bless him, he knows Jesus Christ now. He's, man, my grand, my, his grandkids don't know that man at all. When we talk about a new creation, that's my pops. Like, they don't even know, like, when I talk about my dad, that side, they're like, nah, not Grandpa Petit. But that's what God does. That's what God does, and that's the beauty of it. So real quick, and we'll close out here. Sensitive to the Spirit's leading. Humbly build a bridge. Arouse interest. Reveal sin. Explain the plan of salvation. That's what we do. Okay? If you, if you want, that's what these little books are. It actually is the gospel. And you go, I don't feel comfortable, I, I get nervous, I get, well, guess what? You can leave these around. I've seen people do the rock ministry. Everybody, anybody ever seen the rock ministry? They don't throw rocks at you, but they, they paint the rocks, and there's usually a scripture on it, and they leave it with a bunch of rocks, and you find it. And then, But I always told, I, I think me and Wayne can go do the sand ministry. We'll go to the beach and just write, sand, write the scripture in the sand, and we'll do that every day. And, and the shore will wash it up, and we get to do it all over the next day. <laughs> so, but, you know, be sensitive to the Spirit's leading. Humbly build a bridge. Arouse interest. Reveal sin. And explain the plan of salvation. Uh, Everyday Eternal Conversations is the name of the book by Lloyd Pulley. Great book. Uh, Calvary Old Bridge. Uh, Pastor Lloyd came out of ch church. Um, and so, really good book. Really good book. You can find it online. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray, and we'll go ahead and close it up. The reason why we shared the gospel tonight is because you, 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 if you go out and share the gospel, if, the next thing, you have to make disciples. And so when we come together Sunday, we'll be talking about what discipleship looks like. Okay? So we'll be talking about that, and uh, just be ready for that. And that will end up, well, that will close up our, our essential series, and we'll get right on into the book of Ephesians and back into the book of genesis in uh on wednesday night so back to verse by verse so i'm glad to be doing that let's pray father god we thank you so much for tonight we do pray and we lift up uh this night to you we thank you for us being able to be here and uh to be in your presence we thank you for um those that are here we ask that you bless them lord give them something from the study that they can apply uh you know whether it is that they would be known because hey they've been with jesus like that, I know that guy, man. He's been with Jesus. That if they're sensitive to the Spirit, that God puts somebody on their heart, even tomorrow. I'm praying, Lord, that by Sunday, I'm going to hear all these stories of these conversations that have happened over this week. And who's your neighbor? Your neighbor's everybody. Your neighbor's everybody. It doesn't necessarily be the person that you live next to. It's, it's everybody that you come in contact with. Love on them. 
But remember, your relationship with God is primary, and that has to be uh, the thing that uh, that they have to see. They have to see you being the salt and the light. That you uh, you're you're glorifying God in the conversation. And so I pray, Lord, that you would each person here that we would have an opportunity to share Jesus Christ uh, before Sunday, and that we would continue to do it. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.